Mercury is the planet that makes life interesting. And that word, interesting, really describes Mercury because it's the force within us that is drawn to observe things that are happening around us which spark our interest. What is attracting our attention? Why does it attract our attention? So on a very basic level, looking at your Mercury in your natal chart will show you what you find interesting and how well or how deeply and profoundly you're able to dive into what it, whatever it is that interests you. It's the planet of curiosity, wanting to know more about the world. I like to start off describing Mercury as interesting because it's going to be a theme that runs throughout this video and the next four videos we're going to be doing on Mercury. So just like all of the planets, Mercury is extremely multifaceted and so we're going to be studying what Mercury is within you and how to start seeing how Mercury, how it functions on a very high level and how to begin healing Mercury or analyzing things about Mercury that may need healing. So let's start off with this concept in Vedic astrology that Mercury is androgynous, meaning it has both female and male characteristics in equal proportion. And in most astrological traditions, Mercury is depicted as such. And today there's a trend to label Mercury as a non-binary planet or even as a transgender planet. On the one hand, it makes sense to say Mercury doesn't fit into either the male or female categories, literally not in that binary. But on the other hand, it's a confusing term non-binary because Mercury is both male and female. So just leaving it at non-binary, that doesn't define it. It just says what it's not. It's not binary. And defining something by what it's not isn't defining what it is. So the other problem in the contemporary understanding of the contemporary classification of non-binary or transgender is that these terms are referring specifically to sexual expression, sexual characteristics of the physical body. And again, this is blurring an accurate understanding of what Mercury is. And when Mercury is depicted at, at times when it is as having both male and female sexual organs, this is a symbol that shows that Mercury has both the masculine and feminine forces in equal proportion. So the symbol means that Mercury has this masculine ability for active participation in the world, which it does through inquiry, asking questions, and investigating what's happening in the world. And Mercury also has the feminine ability for contemplation, for observing the world in a passive manner, and introspecting the information that one's gathering. So all the planets have male and female characteristics, but more in proportion one or the other. Mercury is in equal proportion, except for Saturn, which we'll talk about Saturn later. Saturn is a neutered planet, but we'll get to that in due time. So it does a disservice to understand Mercury when it gets associated with sexual activity or the sexual organs, uh, literally. These, these are just symbols that are depicted throughout history. So to further show this, that Mercury shouldn't be associated with anything sexual, Mercury rules Virgo, which is the least sexually active sign of all of the zodiac signs. In Western astrology, Virgo is associated, or Virgo, the symbol for Virgo is this blushing and voluptuous virgin of reproductive age. But in Vedic astrology, the symbol is a prepubescent girl, or just a girl, and not of reproductive age. So Venus is the planet of sensuality. Venus is debilitated in Virgo. It does the worst in Virgo. And so when Virgo also, when it's heavily emphasized in a person's chart, the, the person is much less sexually inclined and can even be very cold sexually. And it can even be called an asexual sign. It's just not interested in sex. And Mercury rules this sign. So again, it's important not to sexualize Mercury because it's not a planet that induces us toward sexual activity. Those would be Mars, which is the raw sexual drive, and Venus of sensuality and physical attraction. But since Mercury has both the masculine and feminine uh, abilities in equal proportion, it shows us that Mercury is a very dynamic and highly changeable planet to whatever a situation needs, whether it's an active participation in the world or passively engaging with the world. It's a planet that we use to find equilibrium and to bring balance into our life. So we'll start with analyzing the active masculine side of Mercury, which is to investigate the world and to understand how it works. We use our Mercury to pick apart details and to analyze details. 
And my astrology teacher, Ernst Wilhelm, he likes to describe Mercury as Sherlock Holmes, the Sherlock Holmes within us. And I did a short documentary describing the very interesting parallels about the, the Mercury force within us and Sherlock Holmes as a literary character, right down to Holmes's tendency towards anxiety and even with his addiction to opium. And that addiction to opium was to, is to help him uh, settle down his overly active mind. So one of the most important abilities of Mercury within us is active learning, which is this masculine ability because it requires effort and initiative to bring in information, to go out and get information. Learning is essentially actively gathering facts and information. And one way to gather information is to ask questions and to inquire about the nature of things. It's the planet that we use to acquire skills and technical abilities. For example, playing the piano requires the physical technique of how to use your hands and to some extent, your, or to an extent also your feet when you're using the pedals. And also Mercury is a system of patterns and mathematical formulas, if you wanna call them mathematical formulas, about how notes assemble into chords, how harmonies work and, and how rhythm works within, uh, how rhythm creates the pacing and the space that the, the, the music is placed into. So we use Mercury in order to learn these rules of how playing the piano works or how anything works in this objective way. You can just mash the keys, ignore all the rules and call that music. And sometimes people call that music, that would be a very impatient Mercury or a weak Mercury. But it's this objective learning, the rules of how things work is what Mercury is doing. The creative aspect of music or being a creative musician is a mixture of Jupiter and Venus. They play a part into it. But Mercury that creates the Mercury part of music specifically, but in general, it's learning how things are structured on an objective rule based and a rule based system. So learn that ability to learn objectively how things work. So a key aspect of Mercury is learning the rules of the game of life. How are things working? Why are systems put together in the way that they're put together? A nice and strong Mercury is in this constant state of learning and it really never ends because you can't learn everything. So the, probably the most common way Mercury is depicted in, in mythology is as the messenger of the gods. He has the shoes uh, with the wings on them. So it's his role to deliver information to people, uh, to be the mediator, the objective mediator of information between people. So this is one of the key aspects of Mercury as this active learner is this ability for us to be objective and logical about information, to engage with information without a personal interpretation of it and these are all masculine qualities. But we're going to talk about the personal interpretation here in a minute. So Mercury in human nature is our ability to objectively explore and learn about the world around us, to be interested and curious about how things work and to probe into exactly how they work in as detailed a fashion as we can handle. So now let's talk about the feminine qualities of Mercury. So there are two, essentially two ways you can learn. You can be active by investigating and experimenting through trial and error. And the other way to learn is to be passive and to absorb information, say from a teacher or simply by observing the world around you. So this is the feminine receptive side of Mercury that is able to ingest the information, either, either given directly by someone or standing back and essentially watching the world. So once we've gathered the information, whether through the active or the passive process, we then introspect that information we contemplate about it and ruminate about it what it means and what does it mean to me specifically so these are all feminine qualities taking in the information and giving it a subjective interpretation giving it significance that doesn't necessarily have to be significant the same significance to you as to another person so one of the most important parts of this feminine introspective introspecting information is the ability for pattern recognition, which is a very high level of Mercury functioning. A person who is able to recognize patterns because they're able to determine what information is significant and how it's significant through this contemplation process. So we find patterns in nature and in life in general by observing and then ordering the information we've gathered and seeing how patterns will connect different details into a larger picture. So some people can see patterns without needing all of the, those details. They essentially just intuit that there's a pattern going on 
the, which is the feminine ability to holistically read and understand a situation without the, the need of specific details. Other people, they need a ton of details first and then they connect the dots and that they see that there's a bigger picture and that the pieces, all the dots aren't separate but actually form this larger pattern. But in either case, it's this feminine quality of Mercury that has this skill of seeing patterns. And also Mercury is the ability to, to use metaphors. And what is a metaphor? It's seeing two things that seem different or are different on the surface but able to recognize a pattern underneath them about how they're working and see the similarity between two different things because the pattern or how there's something connecting them that is the same but not readily visible on the surface. So for example, a funny metaphor I like to use sometimes is saying, oh, we're trying to wrangle cats right now, which is basically when you're trying to organize something and the thing you're trying to organize keeps reorganizing itself on its own volition and against your will. Like when you're trying to gather multiple cats in one place, which is extremely difficult because they, they don't want to be wrangled up. They, uh, they're just going to run away. They don't like being picked up most of the time and they'll just scratch you until you let them go. Try to pick up four cats and hold them at one place at once. They're going to reorganize. So the metaphor, I'm, I'm trying to wrangle cats right now. You, if you say that and it's a windy day and you're trying to rake leaves, underneath it's the same pattern happening like trying to wrangle cats. So basically a good Mercury is good with seeing these underlying patterns between things and being able to communicate using metaphor in a playful and helpful way to understand what's going on, the core of what's going on. And the most profound pattern you can recognize is that everything is connected energetically. We're going to talk about this towards the end of this video when I talk about how Mercury is our ability to investigate and find both the lowercase t truth and the uh, capital T truths in life. Before we get there, let's, let's first connect these male and female sides of Mercury to show us other aspects of what it's doing in our consciousness. Mercury is our ability to communicate. And so what is communication? It's actively the masculine side, verbally or gesturing or otherwise expressing something out into the world. And communication is also passive, the feminine, listening to another person speaking or communicating with you. When Mercury is out of balance in your consciousness, the person will be doing way too much talking or way too much listening, which is these two sides out of balance. Good communication is a two-way street, both the active and passive interaction between people and, sw and yourself switching being active and passive during a conversation. And what is communication based upon? It's based on language, whether it's language in words and phrases or with body language. And what is language? Language is a system of patterns that we use to communicate the abstract ideas into a common understanding between people. So the better a person has a mercury in their consciousness, the better mercury is working in a person, the better communicator they are, the more they'll be interested in language as a system, better at using language to express what they want, using language to their advantage, and the better communicators they are, which of course includes the ability for writing, because you don't always have to ha be an excellent speaker or be um, a great talker to be an excellent communicator if you're able to do it through writing. And you'll need a good Mercury to be able to communicate in more than one language, to be a multilingual person. So back to communication in general, we have these active and passive activities, parts of us happening at the same time. So if you've ever given a presentation over Zoom or online or like what I'm doing right now, and you're not able to see other people's reaction, it feels like you're just talking to yourself or literally you're just talking to yourself. But the interaction that I receive is when I read the comments and people's reaction to the videos and also when I get to speak with people who've watched these videos when I'm doing an astrology reading. So the communication isn't immediate back and forth, but eventually there is this point when I'm able to be on the receiving end and listen to the reaction to what I've said. And then when you're speaking to someone during a reading, you're exchanging information with the person. It's active and passive together. So one idea that really changed the way I think about the world was a course that I took on technology when I was a senior at the University of Illinois. And it was about the evolution of technology from the railroad to telephone lines all the way up to the singularity, the supposed eventual singularity that will happen in the future when the technologists want 
to merge us biologically with technologies. But the most important insight I got in that course was that technology and specifically communication technology is literally and very simply the mediator of information. It's the mediator of communication. It's, it's the middle person. It's, it's literally in between you and another person. And it's what facilitates the communication. And the reason we're seeing such a decline in the quality of human interactions is because the mediator, the technology, is becoming more and more important to the interaction itself. In other words, the more technology advances, the more it increases the quantity of the interactions, but at the, but at the same time is reducing the quality of the interactions. So I'm going to talk about how Mercury is the actor within us when we put on a mask and why we put on a mask. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the reason why this information was so impactful to me during this, when I took this course was because that I was always so into film as an art form. And I've been making short movies since uh, I was a little kid writing scripts and then shooting them and everything. But what I realized was that it's in theater where the actor or the dramatist can have the greatest impact on an audience because there's no technological middle person between you and the drama. What is happening is that there's a direct embodied communication between the action happening on the stage and the person sitting, physically sitting in the audience. You feel the drama in your body. There's nothing in between you and the, the action, the play, the drama. But with a movie, the action is mediated by the screen and therefore there's a separation between you and the drama taking place. So the, but the advantage of film is that you can take the audience to the ends of the world, to another country, whatever. You can do a lot with film. But the technological mediator, the, the television screen or the movie screen between you and the actors and the drama, that makes a big difference. And the reason why all of this pertains to Mercury is because Mercury is our ability to be exchanging information with other people. And the best, most effective way and powerful way is person to person. So not only are you exchanging words, but the nonverbal information, observing the facial expressions and the actual energetic, pre energetic presence of the person, their aura, taking all of that information and giving that information to other people, this is an integral part of what Mercury does when we're communicating. And one of the central critiques of social media and how technology is negatively affecting humanity is that communication skills are decreasing in people and people are hemorrhaging their ability to have meaningful face-to-face -face relationships and friendships, which leads to all types of social anxiety and antisocial behavior. And this plays into how Mercury malfunctions in our consciousness, which we'll talk about in the next video. So I just mentioned that Mercury is the actor in our consciousness. And why is that? We're not all actors by trade, but we all have a part of us that presents to the world something that it's the surface presence, a mask that we put on for different, different situations. There's a part of, there's a part of that in everybody. Some people use it a lot. Some people never use it. Some people don't want to use it, but it's a part of us. So what does Mercury rule in our body? Well, Gemini is the sign of, uh, of our hands, of our arms and our hands, but Mercury also rules the skin, which is the covering, which is any kind of covering essentially. And our skin covers up all of the rest of our body. It's the, it's the surface. And Mercury rules the surfaces of things that are concealing something else underneath or protecting something underneath. So any container, the container is Mercury. The walls on your house are Mercury, the roof. The packaging that a product comes in, Mercury rules that package. So a way to think about Mercury is this mask, the exterior. And it's concealing, but there's something different underneath the mask that the mask is concealing. And what else is an actor doing? They're experimenting with what it would be like to be another person for a little while, and then they go back to being themselves. And when you embody another person, you're playing with what it's like to be them in this dramatic context or in a story. So acting is playing, and that's why we call it a play in theater. It's playing. So Mercury is this ability we have to play with possibilities, to both experiment with that possibility, what is that possibility, and then to see if that possibility is worth incorporating into your own life. And if it doesn't work, then you discard it. You are just trying it out in a sense, you know, you, there's, no, there's no commitment. So Mercury is this part of us that's playing with what it's like to 
to try out different ex experiences. And when you think about it, we all put on different masks and we all behave differently in different situations. And it's neither positive or negative, it's just uh, an action. If you go, say, to a funeral, you put on the mask of, of sorrow and being um, con uh, the condolences, whether you deeply feel that within you or not. You don't go to a funeral and, sell and well, you can celebrate in certain cultures you celebrate, but in other cultures, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't laugh, you don't you know, make light of things that would be treated as disrespectful, but you're putting on this, this mask, this uh, way to present yourself to the world. And all of these, you can think of a million different contexts that would happen. This is the Mercury part of us to really, in the sense of an actor, really become another person, but to play different roles in different situations in your life. So Mercury is this part of us that's really testing the waters of life to see if things work out and to see if things are worth continuing to doing and really not taking it too seriously if something doesn't work out, you're just trying it out. So combining this idea of playing with possibilities, not taking things too seriously, and with the idea of being objective and to be able to find patterns in things, pattern recognition. When you combine these abilities and talents of Mercury, what you get is comedy. And Mercury is so often portrayed as the trickster archetype or the jester. And these are things within us. And Mercury is this planet that rules our sense of humor. We all have this part of us in our consciousness and that's what Mercury is. A comedian in the world has to have a good Mercury. And so it's really interesting when you think about what is humor in general. It's a very fascinating topic. Why are things funny to us but maybe not funny to another person? Why do we laugh in the first place? And so when you think about it, laughter is a very divine and spiritual thing. It automatically makes a person feel better if you're feeling down. It's this source of potential joy within us, of being able to see beauty and truth in the patterns of the world, and which we experience as, quote unquote, something is funny. And it's even more interesting when you think about how comedy or funny things can be dark or, or black comedy. And of course, there are things that are universally funny. Essentially, everyone agrees that, yeah, that's funny. Well, comedy and humor, what it is, it's seeing a pattern in the world happening and then making light of it. And the more universally true something is, and the more you can depict it in a lighthearted way, the funnier it is. And so that's why comedian, some comedians are better than other comedians because they can see patterns or find experiences in life that almost everybody can identify with it. And then they make a comment upon it, they do a bit, and they make you think about it differently and they make it a lighter subject and it makes it less heavy. And it's why comedians are so useful when it comes to politics because politics on it by itself is, is such a heavy subject. And making fun of rulers or making fun of politicians, it's a great way to, one, put a check on their power, but also two, to turn them into regular people, and just like you and me, and that they are human beings like us. And so humanizing them and to get them off their high horse or get them off their power trip. And what's interesting is that a lot of the times the politicians, they can be lighthearted about it. And when I grew up, SNL would make fun of the presidents equally and, and the presidents wouldn't really think about it too much or South Park, you know, the comedians have their say and you kind of have to let them have their say because if what they're saying is true and you fight against it, you look much worse if you don't have the ability to laugh at yourself. So recently there was a report that Mark Zuckerberg came out and he apologized for censoring people on Facebook because the White House was pressuring him to censor people and specifically to censor uh, satire, jokes, and memes. This was all happening in 2020 and 2021. They wanted them to go after jokes and memes. And why? And Zuck, Mark Zuckerberg apologized for caving to the pressure. He said he didn't want, he didn't really want to do it. And you can see that there's this huge power in comedy because it diffuses bad ideas or ridiculous ideas or people in just a matter of seconds. The White House saw the danger that if they were to allow comedy, people would start laughing at them and not take them seriously seriously enough. And that was a threat to the, their power. So hundreds of millions of dollars can be spent on propaganda or speeches and, and building up systems of power. But one meme or one joke can explode all of it because it's getting at the heart of the matter in a funny, light way 
using rhetoric or just being able to see the truth in something extremely simply. So all of this comes from Mercury's ability to see patterns, to see the humor in patterns and communicate it in this and communicate that pattern in an effective way so that the maximum amount of people can understand it. So there's this classic idea of the jester in the king's court of say uh, a, a tyrannical king. He was, the jester was the only one who could tell the honest to God unfiltered truth to the king without getting his head chopped off because he would tell the king the truth in an entertaining way that would make the king laugh, literally telling truth to power. And the great writer and sat satirist, 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 Oscar Wilde said that if you want to tell people the truth, you have to make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you. So just before we wrap up, one final but really critically important quality of Mercury, the Mercury within us, is that we use Mercury to make things real and concrete in our life. And we call it a manifesting planet because we use Mercury or what it does is it transfers an abstract idea into the practical, tangible reality. So one reason for this is that Mercury rules is ruled by the element Earth. And just like all the Earth signs, Mercury is able to make things concrete and deals with concrete things in our material reality. So Mercury uses this Earth quality and this manifesting ability primarily through communication, as we were talking about, and turning these abstract ideas in your head into words or writing them down, giving them a very practical, real function. And Mercury also manifests through the use of our hands, which is ruled by Gemini, and Mercury rules Gemini. And when you think about our hands, our hands make more happen in real life than really any other body part. Besides, say, our brain and our face, these, these are really important. The face and the brain, the brain cognizes things. The face is able to receive information. These are really important, but it's the hands that do the work. They make things real. Like think of cooking food or writing things down, doing manual labor, cleaning your house, using your phone. Our hands are the kind of the mediator between our thoughts and the material world. And just like our verbal ability, but even more so than our verbal ability to make an idea real in the thought forms and the, and the sound waves, and Mercury rules the throat chakra as well, so to be able to express uh, verbally our ideas, that's a Mercury action, but even more so the hands, really getting your hands dirty and doing things in the world. This is how we use Mercury to make things real in front of us. So we're gonna talk about it a lot more in the next video about malfunctioning Mercury. But when your Mercury is unhealthy, you're essentially stuck in your head and you can't express what you really want to say or express your ideas effectively so other people can understand them. And you're not using your hands to manifest those ideas in the real world. So it's a manifestation problem that is one of the root causes of a malfunctioning Mercury. And really think about it as this manifest or how well am I making things real in my life? Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. Just manifest it with your energy or the use of your hands and you're gonna feel satisfied but one of the core problems of a poorly functioning Mercury is, problem, is the problem of manifestation and making things real in front of you. So now let's combine all of these ideas and traits of Mercury we just discussed and see what, this fun, what the fundamental role of Mercury, what it's doing in our consciousness, in human nature. We use Mercury within us to find the truth. Mercury investigates, it experiments, learns, listens, communicates, and plays around with these possibilities and these opportunities in life to see if they're gonna work and make our lives better. And we put ourselves in the places of other people to see what their experiences are really like. We take on different roles in different sections of our life in different uh, situations, which you know a high level is an actor or a performer. And all of this activity that Mercury does, it's to explore and discover what uh, what you can say is lowercase t truth, small t truth, which is truth that may be subjective to us, what we like or don't like, or temporarily something that's temporarily accurate or factual, but it can change in the future, like a, stati like a statistic or data of an ongoing process, not statistics from the past. Those are factual pieces of data, but you can dive into all of these different ways, what is truth, what is not truth. But essentially, this small t truth of things that are subject to change, things that we like, things that are true specifically to us. And it's also the capital T truth to discover what are capital T truths, the biggest truths in life. 
and things that really are not subject to change, things that don't change no matter how much us as individuals change or how the human race changes or human beings change. There are things in nature and in life that don't change. And so these things that don't change, these capital T truths, could be really simple things like plants need water to grow. It doesn't matter what you think or it doesn't matter what human beings do, plants need water to grow. And then it can extend to other bigger metaphysical capital T truths that philosophers explore and, and all of that. So the mercury that is the mercury within us is working to find what is true in our lives. For example, and this is the small t truth. So for example, for me, it's true that I enjoy studying astrology. And it's true that yesterday I ate acai and that I am sitting here in this spot right now and it's slightly cloudy today. All of these things are not true for other people, but I used my mercury to discover what makes my life more enjoyable. I engage in those activities like studying astrology or eating acai. And these are my, these are my objective conditions at this moment. These are all facts that are specific to me. These small T truths that pertain to my life. The capital T truth, the big truths have nothing to do with me personally. And we use mercury to find out what these things could be. So no matter how much I tell myself that in the sky right now, that that's the moon, no matter how much I say that it's never going to be the moon. That's the sun. It will, the, me saying that that's the moon will never be a capital T truth. So there are things in life that are universally true. And you can think of Mercury as this lifelong quest within us or a high performing Mercury, a very high level Mercury to attempt to figure out what those capital T truths of the world can be. So the American director and writer Orson Welles, he had an unfinished film he, he shot in South America just after he finished Citizen Kane or a little bit after. And the title of this unfinished film was called It's All True. And that phrase was really interesting when I heard it. I had to think about it for some times because, because I think not everything is true. And I didn't really understand it. And I, you know, kind of thought it was a little bit ridiculous that everything can't be true. Like that's the, that's the moon. That's not the sun. That's not true. You know, so that phrase, it's all true. But when, when I thought about it more, the phrase, it's all true. That's the highest level of understanding what Mercury is capable of in our consciousness that yes, it's all true. And what's interesting is that Orson Welles had a, his theater company or his production company was called the Mercury Theater. So he was a very mercurial person, of course. So this idea, it's all true. When I say that that's the moon in front of me and not the sun, there are waveforms of thought energy, material thought energy and the sound energy that's emanating from my mouth and from my, and from my mind. And these waveforms and these sound waves are true. They exist. They're real. And when I said, so what I said, the meaning of what I said may not be universally true that that's the moon and not the sun, but the underlying fabric of the reality emanating from me is real and true. That is the part that is true. It's, it actually, I actually said that and that fundamental aspect of reality that is real. Although what I said wasn't a universally agreed on thing. So all of, ex all of existence, literally everything in the universe, is real and true, even if it's a false statement or, or, an, or just still an idea. Everything at its foundation is energy flowing in and around us. It's all just, it's all just um, kind of this subatomic energy that's moving around us. And we call that energy God or all that is. So the deity for Mercury in Vedic astrology is Vishnu. And what Vishnu, what that means is all pervading. Literally everything is Vishnu. Everything is God on this energetic level. So Mercury is this force within us that's capable of reaching that realization through, through the qualities of Mercury, through investigating, through learning, through experimenting and enjoying possibilities and enjoying these situations in life. And seeing that eventually everything comes back to the same thing. It's all God. It's all true. It's all at the basic and the most base level, the same thing. And the only difference is that that same thing takes on this infinite variety of appearances of these different forms. And as I said, Mercury is the coverings of things. But once Mercury investigates and gets below that covering, there's something universal in all of that. And that is God. That's the ability to see that everything is connected. 
So Mercury is, a high level Mercury is able to dig deeper into things and realize that it's all true underneath the surface reality.